it's got to a point where I have friends now who have good jobs, they make good money, they have a great apartment, they have everything you could ever want in life. And they, we're like having open discussions about like, I think about just like stealing stuff. <laughs> like when they go into a store, they go into a CVS. Yeah, because they're like, hey, there's, you literally could do it for free because there's no penalty. That's, that's what they're, they're, we're having serious conversations about morally, like where do you stand with it? Because it's not illegal now or it's not, you can't get in trouble it's for it. It's not punishable, yeah. Not punishable. Normal, rational people now, because it's so okay to commit these crimes, are, are, are justifying it to themselves because they're like, well, you can't get in trouble for it, so Hey guys, welcome to Prepared. I'm in California, I'm in Los Angeles. We're looking at part one of a two-part series on what's going on as California further deteriorates because of a lot of issues, guys. There's, I mean, there's so many variables here. The reason I'm so passionate about specifically what's going on in California is I think it's an example of what potentially could happen across the country. It's already happened. It's happening in New York. It's happening in Chicago. And so when I, when I look at the issues California is facing, it has a lot to do with policy that are enacted or um, executively mandated by the politicians of the state. I don't understand a lot of it. I wanted to get to the ground truth. I wanted to see how the border issues that we talked about in Arizona have kind of translated to some of the issues that are being faced with Californians being a sanctuary state. And so part one of this series, I'm with Jack Osborne, who's a real good friend of mine. He's a guy who has trained with me for years. Um, he's a man who cares very deeply about his family, his preparedness. I mean, we talk in a segment that's on the app and content, the Phil Craft Survival app, all about his preparedness game, talking about community all the way to his EDC, which is really cool. Now, you're talking about somebody who grew up in California, in Los Angeles specifically, from the age of 11 till he was doing a reality TV show in his teens uh, with his family, the Osbournes, uh, all the way to right now being a, a grown man, uh, doing a lot of TV, doing a lot of podcast. And he's at the point right now in his life where he's like, man, this is too much. And he's looking for an out. We talk about that perspective because he's seen it as a child where he used to ride his bike up and down the streets of Los Angeles. And now he would never even allow his children to leave the house because all of the things that are going on. So we focus on that. It's a lot of content in the two-part series. A lot of the specifics of the content and the nitty gritty and the details of the long form conversations I have will be available on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Mike Glover. In fact, this account, this trip is funded by patron members who support my Patreon. And I appreciate you guys for, uh, for assisting me in that. Uh, we have tier one levels where we do a little bit more content for you guys, specialty content. And then we put the underground of prepared, which is all the nitty gritty and the overflow of content that we get that we can't put on YouTube or anywhere else because it will be suppressed. We make that available to your Patreon. You can see that link down below. Make sure you're subscribed, hit the notification tab, all that good stuff. But let's get into it. Let's get into the uh, interview with Jack Osborne and the drive around of, of Los Angeles. Thanks, guys. All right, so I'm gonna say, because of your neck, just put your head on your headrest. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. Holy shit. Oh, Jesus. Oh my God, dude. That scared the fuck out of me. I almost shit myself. <laughs> dude, my body, like, that's so many, that's like a lot of Gs. Yes, dude. That's why I said, Whoa. put your head back. <laughs> that is the fastest shit I've ever been in in my life. What the hell is that? It's the plan, dude, it's fucking. I feel like we just went back in time or something. <laughs> So you, let's talk a little bit about you, because, you know, for people who don't know who you are, you grew up in a celebrity family. Yep. You're considered a celebrity now, and that lifestyle is a lot different. And you grew up in L.A., right? Yeah, yeah. I grew, I've been out in L.A. Permanent, permanently, we moved here when I was about uh, 11. So I've been here my entire life, for the most part. Yeah. And something that you said to me, which was interesting, because... You know, you're a family man now, which is rad to see. Congrats on the on, on being married. Thank you. Or the, the wedding. Um, but you're a family man, and like you said, 
when you were a kid, you could ride your bike anywhere. Yeah. And now you won't even let your kids leave the house. Nope. I don't let them go out onto the sidewalk of my house, right out in front, alone, nothing. Yeah. It's just that this place changed so much in the last 10 years, it is mind numbing. And you saw the whole transition the whole of thing. that thing happening, right? The whole thing. And, it, and I can remember sitting back being like, wow, like why, what's happening here? And then once, once COVID hit, it just accelerated it. Interesting. So uh, COVID kind of amplified everything. It just accelerated the whole process. You think? Absolutely. What it, what it did was, because there used to be certain areas where you weren't allowed to sleep in your vehicle. You yeah. had to, you couldn't park more than a few hours. They would move you on. During COVID, they stopped doing that. They were just like, no, people have a right to, you know, post up wherever they want. Um, and it, it, it just was one of those things where everyone just seemed okay with it because they were more concerned with this, that, and the other. And, oh, you know, everyone's dying from this, you know, this mysterious virus. And, and we're going to pass a place up here, you'll see. Um, You'll see a lot of the these, uh, you know, as we kind of cruise through. We'll, we'll just a, a we're gonna cruise through the valley, and then we're gonna go into Hollywood, and I'll show you guys some things. So, you see all these RVs parked up. Yeah. And this is becoming more and more popular, where people will just post up RVs in the middle of. Are you serious? Yeah. Like, look at this. This is this is essentially an RV park now. What? Yeah. This is just the side of the road, like yeah. running a, a And random... this is this is actually really clean. Whoever's doing this, whatever this situation yeah. is, there that this is very well maintained. Because normally they don't look like this. I'll take you to one directly across the street from my kids' school. So wait, so if if you haven't if you live in a house here, it's millions of dollars. But if you park on the side of the road in a designated parking area, then you could stay there for free for as long as you want. For as long as you want. They, they can move you on, but they have to evict you. So it's essentially- It's, it's a process? A, it's a process. So they get given papers and I think they get, it's, there's a time limit. I wanna say it's 14 days or something like that. I could be wrong. So don't, don't hold me that, but they're, they're given like, okay, you must vacate this premise within X amount of days. We will be coming up to clean everything up behind you. So if you can't carry it with you or whatever, um, it's going to get thrown away or we'll put it in storage for you. Interesting. Because they don't want to violate people's constitutional rights through search and seizure, you know, without due process. So they, their storage units full of junk that um, homeless people collect. What, what do you think the breakdown over the 10 years was? Was, it, was, it, was there a very specific thing that happened or did it just progressively get worse over time? The, what was told to me, and I'm not sure, I never researched this, I just went on how it was told to me, was there was a nonprofit that had some kind of legal, there was a nonprofit that did advocacy for the homeless population in LA. So this nonprofit uh, won a court case that, which was like I just said, they cannot um, move people on without due process and they cannot uh, throw away their belongings um, because it's a constitutional violation. Interesting. Yeah. So it became case law. It became case law. And so everyone, they were like, okay, fine, fair enough. And it began to slow down how uh, enforcement of these laws were, you know, were being done. It seems like uh, it seems like a lot of the things that people say. I've, I've heard Rogan say it. I've I've heard you say it before. It's like a, a lot of it is just not enforcing normal decency and laws that exist across the country. Yeah. Like you know, like you have codes in municipalities for reasons because you know you don't want a certain sign to be displayed. You don't want something to be out of place. You don't want trash all over the place. But it seems like all of that has gone away and it's a free game. It's a free game for anybody. It's, it's gone away uh, for a, a population. Adam Carolla said it best. There's people who are on grid and there's people who are off grid. People who are on grid are, you know, people that have cars and an apartment and a job and whatever. They have a life, they have life. Um, we still have to follow the rules. And you'll see things where people are getting, you know, we'll get tickets and, 
will get arrested for crimes that if you're if you're homeless or unhoused, which is the, the now the new PC term that is being utilized in, in, in LA. Like it's it's a dirty word to say homeless now, apparently. Um, of course. Yeah. Uh, so if you're unhoused, if you're homeless, you you can do whatever you want. I've seen people crapping in the streets, doing drugs, just open. The morning I was driving my kids to school. There's a it was a bus stop on a main intersection up here, which is uh, which was Laurel and Ventura Boulevard. Um, there's a homeless guy just sat there smoking fentanyl. Just wow. Just out in the open, not a care in the world. Yeah, and then if you call the police, they wouldn't do anything? Or LAPD will literally say, there's nothing we can do. Wow. I know LA is dealing with a lot of stuff, including, you know, homelessness is like 75,000, as it's reported by LA, uh, homeless people on it's the streets. It's more than that. Yeah, it's, it's more than that, right? It's more than that, man. That's it's... what I hear. It's, it, it, that number seems like it's it's low when everybody, whenever I ask somebody who's from here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh... It, it is more than that, for sure. And I know that, that I saw the statistics, even though murder is down, crime across the board is up. Do you get a sense of that? Have you talked to friends of yours who live here? 100%. Yeah. Like, it is without a doubt, everyone would say that. And then you see, you know, our illustrious governor Newsom on TV being like, no, crime is down. What he did, he decriminalized crimes. So, People are committing more crimes, but now they're not punishable. So stati- they're not designated crimes. They're not so. designated crimes. It's more or wow. less what he did. Yeah. You know, they let out a bunch of people from prison, and um, you know there was a program where they they got rid of the drug courts, and they were gonna supposedly they they passed this law. I forget what it was, but it was we're gonna let nonviolent drug offenders out of prison. And we're gonna open up state-run uh, rehabilitation centers, and everyone was like, "Okay, that seems like a great idea." They signed off on it, you know. It got voted in, um, and then they never opened up the rehabilitation centers, but they let everyone out of prison. So you had a bunch of, you know, men and women who were now let out on the streets, who had significant mental health disorders, substance abuse issues, with nowhere to go and no resources that the state had promised them to get get well and like I, I you know I've been in recovery 20 years I understand I firsthand am aware of the um the the trials and tribulations of dealing with substance abuse what does that mean you've been in recovery so I've been so with 20 nearly you know, like nearly 21 years so 21 years ago you went to a facility you got uh help yep and then that led to sobriety for 21 years yes congrats thank you and, you know, I have s- countless friends who are living under bridges, you know, hope to die junkies, shooting up in their neck, whatever. They get sober, they get their life together, and they, they have a, a relatively, you know, normal existence. But they were given the resources, sometimes by nonprofits and sometimes, you know, from the state at the time, because there used to be drug courts here, uh, to get well. And that just is, that's gone. You're, you're a friend with a lot of celebrities, um, being a celebrity yourself. And, and I'm interested because politically, a lot of people like to align opinions like these with a conservative movement or a Republican movement. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think it's non-political and just in common decency? And what do your celebrity friends say about things like this? Oh, man, it's th- what they what they tend to say is it's a lot of it. They're just everyone's terrified to to speak their mind now. Yeah, they just regurgitate the script that they don't want to get canceled. No, they don't want to get canceled. Yeah, they don't want to uh, you know miss out on an opportunity. They don't want to be labeled something. But at the end of the day, I just look at it. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on there's a significant problem here that isn't getting better with, and even the amount of money that has been spent. I saw, I said, I saw something recently and it was, I don't know if this is true or not. They said it was $11 billion has been spent. I don't, in, I don't know in what time period in the state of California to fix the problem. It's got worse. Yeah. I don't care yeah. what side of the fence you are. That just me just says that's corruption personified. <laughs> like that's it. 
That's the pure definition of it. When you're pay when we're paying all this money to fix it and it's getting worse, it tells me that that's not the correct solution. And I do believe that a, a lot of these people can be helped if they're given the right, if there's the right system in place. You can't make someone get sober. You can't make someone want to take meds. They have to want to do it themselves. Yeah. Before I came here, I pulled up the LA crime mapping software and there's on the website, they track every crime that's taking place this year via an icon. And when you scan across every block to block, there's crime obviously littered everywhere. It's hard to find a place that doesn't have crime taking place. Yeah. And it's it's really ama it's it's really it's really shocking to see that like when you geolocate crime that it exists on every single city block in LA mm -hmm. in some form or fashion. And the majority of it is larceny, burglary, and petty crime. People yeah. stealing people's stuff. It, theft here is, I, this is how, decri like it, it's hard to say. It's got to a point where I have friends now who have good jobs, they make good money, they have a great apartment, they have everything you could ever want in life. And they, we're like having open discussions about like, I think about just like stealing stuff. <laughs> like when they go into a store, they go into a CVS. Yeah, because they're like, hey, there's, you literally could do it for free because there's no penalty. That's, that's what they're, they're, we're having serious conversations about morally, like where do you stand with it? Because it's not illegal now, or it's not, you can't get in trouble it's for it. It's not punishable, yeah. Not punishable. But yeah, and it, but that's the, that's what's happening. Normal, rational people now, because it's so okay to commit these crimes, are, 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 are justifying it to themselves because they're like, well, you can't get in trouble for it, so fuck it. Wow. Yeah. How, how insane is that? Yeah. That, that's the society that we're in. <laughs> it's, it's almost like, it, it literally is almost like an experiment gone wrong, right? Yeah. It's like a social experiment. And what's unique about California is that there's a whole bunch of great stuff about California. Oh, it is. I love California, but but when it comes to the governance of people, politicians have completely played this game of of literally charades with human beings, mm -hmm. and it's sad to see. It's it's like I wish people would step up and stand up and and actually do something to, about it. Yeah. Is there anything in your opinion, like how do we turn this around? Because I'm most interested in like there's a lot of problems obviously to identify, but what's your opinion on turning this thing around? So I recently was made aware of a program that I think San Antonio did where they spent a couple hundred million on building a facility that was that provided housing, uh, mental health resources, uh, rehabilitation, all this stuff in one, you know, under one roof. It was basically a, uh, a one stop shop. A one stop shop. And it has had incredibly positive results. We have so much space in this county. There's parts of this place where I, I could drive you and you'd be, I'd be like, yeah, technically we're still in LA County and it's just rolling hills and, you know, up into the mountains and beautiful. You, you could build something like that here so easily and they just won't. They just won't. And I, and that to me is a, is a great solution. It's like it, it, mental health and drug addiction does not get cured by just ignoring it and letting it metastasize. Yeah, you have to have a program, a process. Yeah. But it seems like there's no process. There's no, no program. There's no plan. No plan. And it, they say that there's a plan. You, you, I just don't, I don't see it. Are people, I don't know if this, not just celebrities, but professionals that have substantiated themselves in this industry, in this space, in California, that are your friends, are they saying the same things? Like, were they looking for the out? Or are they just committed to like, hey man, it's just what it is? It's a bit of both. Yeah. There are some people who are certainly looking for the out that are like, I just, you know, I can't leave because of X, Y, and Z or, you know, whatever. Uh, people are split. You know, people need to think they need to stay here because of the industry. Um, and, but I know so many people that move, tons of people move to Austin, Nashville, um, Salt Lake. Uh, they, they got out during, you know, it was a, very much a COVID get out of the city because they, this place took it, went crazy with it, with the restrictions. Yeah, I remember when that happened and 
this place was known for shutting down small business, <clears throat> kind of a lot of businesses obviously didn't survive. Yeah. And it's because of that shutdown. If that happened again, I don't I don't know if it if people have it in them to comply. No. Maybe, maybe there will be some resistance. What are, you, what are your law enforcement buddies saying about kind of the state of affairs? They're uh, very frustrated, incredibly frustrated because they want to be able to do that job, but their hands are so tied in the, the you know, the post George Floyd world of law enforcement. And, and they're just, they're, I mean, LAPD pre-COVID wasn't amazing. And post COVID, it's it's even worse. I mean, you can my my kid's school last year had to call LAPD. I think twelve times over an incident. Wow. Over a you know a homeless person wandering around, someone trespassing on the property. There was a guy with a knife out front of the school at one point. LAPD didn't show up once. After those calls were made? After the calls were made. I think maybe one time they showed up, and I, I, I think I heard it was like four hours later. What's interesting is, now that you mention it, since we've been talking and driving, and I've been looking, I haven't seen one police officer. No. I saw one guy giving tickets yeah. on the side of the road. People on grid. Is that, is that a different uh, policing uh, tactic that they've implemented? Where it's like, I know Chicago, Santanello was talking about this on his YouTube channel, where um, Chicago officers now, they sit in an, like a surveillance observation kind of post mm. and they literally just sit in their car and they don't respond to any calls. They no. just, they just hang out as a presence, but they don't actively offensively patrol and you will, laws. you will see police patrolling. I'm surprised we haven't seen any, yeah. but then again, also I'm not surprised. It's, it's not a coming in contact with, with law enforcement in LA isn't very common. Yeah. There's no, there's very little community policing. Like, I don't know the cops that patrol my neighborhood. Um, I don't, you just don't, you don't see them. But yeah, this whole era, like when I was a kid, I used to, I had an apartment actually right back there on Hollywood and Vine in, in the Broadway building. And we used to walk around two, three o'clock in the morning, totally safe, nothing to worry about. And then about a year ago, right here, right in that parking structure, someone got shot in the face, just in their car. Wow. I mean, robberies constantly. I was actually, this street that we're driving on, this is the way I go to get to my parents' house. Um, I was driving and I just see like a crazy police foot pursuit. Maybe like a dozen cops is chasing this guy and he's fighting the police. And it was like full on and my kids were just sat in the car, just full wide eyed, like, oh my God. How does that feel as a father? I mean, I, I, like, I can't imagine that life with my kids yeah. and you're, you're in it. You know, I, you kind of expect it in a big city. You know, you expect there to be a little, it's a little more visible, but it sucks. You know, the worst part is when you see people like defecating or urinating on the street and I have my kids with me. That's the stuff that really bothers me. So you got a little, a little encampment right here. See, look at this. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, so this is the whole stretch from from sunset down to Santa Monica was all this. There used to be a bunch of businesses here and it just got completely taken over and destroyed. And and they're not willing to do anything about that. I mean, it's just... They'll come in, they'll clean it up, and then a month later, everyone's moved back. But they are, it is improving. It's just, but they're, all they're doing is like shuffling the, the cards. They move them from one side, you know, one side of town to the other, and it's really, um, it's really just frustrating. It just sucks, you know. And you 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 said a little bit off camera about the immigration issue. It it doesn't seem like this place is dealing with the normal immigration overflow you see in like Chicago and New York, but. That's mostly because they're being shipped to the agriculture belt, potentially. It's it, to my knowledge that is a that is happening, uh, but I think the main thing is LA is so big yeah, oh, yeah. that if a bus comes up here, if, you know, from one of the you know from Texas or whatever, they're dropping them downtown. And so I think it's I think downtown when you go to Skid Row, you'll see a lot more. Um, you, I think it'll be a lot more 
like prevalent down there. Yeah. It used to be, and I used to talk about this, I talk about this with my kids. When you used to get off the airplane at LAX, the air was sweet. There was just this like sweet smell in the air. It's kind of like when you go to Hawaii. Yeah. And there's that like. It's like food. Yeah, it just smells good. You're like, yeah. oh, this place is awesome. Just the smell of it. And uh, that's, that's all gone. That's like, you used to be able to smell the grass when they cut it at Griffith. You could smell it all through the city. So this is Melrose. Melrose is pretty spicy these days. Like, you don't want to, you don't want to really cruise around here too much. Like, a lot of the footage that you saw of people getting held up at cafes and robbed outside of stores was all Melrose. This is, a, Melrose is like a road? Melrose Avenue, yeah. Okay bunch of restaurants, but this place just got, I mean, it got destroyed during COVID. And it was, and here's the crazy thing. It was a lot of these businesses that were destroyed were like minority owned businesses. Yeah. It's not like they went to, I mean, they also went to Rodeo Drive and things like that. And we're kind of, you know, trying to stick it to the man. But I was like, why are you destroying that sneaker shop that's been here for 25 years and everyone yeah. goes to? It's like, well, they went, they went, you know, they went and they broke in, they, everyone looted the place. And the crazy thing is, I know of shop owners who were robbed during the, the riots and all, they had all, you know, all their merchandise stolen and they recognized actual customers that had been coming to their shop. That knew who they were. They knew, yeah, they knew the people. That's sad. Yeah, and they're like, why the fuck would you do that? Yeah, I think 50% of the businesses in Atlanta are African-American owned. And when they had the, the civil unrest and the riots, they burned down businesses that were black owned businesses. Yeah. So, and, I, and I get it, people what? pissed off, angry. They wanna, they wanna feel like they're doing something, but like. Yeah, don't destroy people's lives. Yeah. So this was Melrose Mac. I sat here one of the, during the, one of the big riots and I watched them just stealing everything from that place. And I, I remember seeing a, a, a piece on it where they said because of the liability in it and because they couldn't target specifically who it was, which is the tactic that's used by mobs, they would never chase. No. And so they would never detain because most of the people that are specifically there are part of the distraction. And it was hard to pinpoint who was re actually responsible, even though they were all responsible. I mean, yeah. the, the answer is... They should all be detained because they're they're literally an accessory to a crime. But their procedure was, since we don't know specifically who it is, we're just going to let it take place mm -hmm. and then figure it out afterwards, which opened the doors to free access to crimes. So this right here, homeless encampment, will go two blocks, and the headquarters of Chrome Heart is right here. Of what? Chrome Hearts, that multi-billion dollar jewelry company. <laughs> the headquarters is right here. Yeah. I believe it's on one of these streets. Oh no, I think I'm one street down. Yeah, it's the next one up. Yeah, even inconspicuously, the cars, like that car and that car there, she's living out of her, yeah. her car. Someone will be living out of this car right here. Yeah, right in front of somebody's house. Yeah, that's realistically, that's a two and a half to three million dollar house. And then somebody's living in front of it. I can't imagine, like, I don't know if, like, I, I would not be able to control no. myself in confronting those people that are parked in front of my house with my kids. Yeah. I imagine that kind of confrontation happens routinely here. It does, actually. There, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of button heads over it. Okay, so, yeah, here it is. So, there used to be encampments all along here. This is the headquarters to Chrome Hearts. But, yeah, they cleaned it up a little bit. It didn't look too bad. No. But like I said, they kind of come through. You don't know when, why, and they'll... See, like they Chrome and they'll Hots. move people on. Chrome Hearts has like their own security. Now, is the is the purpose of is the purpose of the we had placement for his gun. I know, and he was like, oh, they're like they got good eyes though. They're looking at everything like it's a 
potential threat. Well, yeah, because this is a spice. This is a spicy part of town. Through yeah. There. Here we go. Look, we got this right here. Wow, yeah, this is a big one. Look at it. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. Oh, like you said, all the bikes. Yeah. They just steal everybody's bikes. Yeah, dude, that, that's probably a $2,000 e-bike right there. Oh, let's see if we can buy that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Look I at got 100 look bucks. At, look at that thing. That is literally a, a $7,000 e-bike. Yeah. Dude. And it's all bikes, so it's dude, all. Dude, I would actually give that guy 100 bucks for that I bike. literally, I know, you should. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, here's a here's another one of the trailers that people will live in. It's so crazy that, as a tactic, like likely in the numbers of the seventy five thousand, like you said, they're not they're not part of the number because they're technically not homeless, but they're in a you know exactly whatever this is hundred percent yeah like how do you what is that that's like a that's an old school. Yeah, a little caravan. Got like an actual. I'd love to talk to the guys like that and be like, hey, what's your story, man? Like, what happened? Dude, that's a really nice e-bike. That that e-bike is literally a like a five seven thousand dollar yeah. e-bike with an adapter. Yeah, dude, Just... look at all the. It's got the. Oh, red. Oh, is that a rental? Yeah. Oh, it might be. Yeah. yeah, as you can see, the key. Yeah. But yeah, that's a full little. So the whole they're they're living behind between two fences and they blocked off the entire sidewalk. Yep. Like and, like loitering used to be a crime. Yeah. And hey, there we go. that's that considered loitering. Yeah, that guy's just fentanyled out of his mind. Oh, he told out the toll paper. Yeah. So this is, uh, as compared to Skid Row, which we're gonna tour tomorrow with your buddy, I imagine. Oh, dude, we're in Beverly Hills compared to what Skid Row is. Yeah. And look, you got Sirius XM's headquarters are right here. And like that thing's not moving. Yeah. That thing's huge. Well, at least he's got it leveled though. <laughs> the generator's going. Yeah. Like full out, like. Yeah. Wow. Two generate. Damn, okay. And nobody's like, like if you work in that building and your office is right there, you're like, dude, seriously? And then you call the cops and they're like, we can't do anything. Can't do anything. They can they can put the paperwork in to get them relocated and this, that, and the other, but what he, what's he gonna do? He's gonna move it a block down. And then you guys start it all over again. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's like this real it's just it's, it's a mouse on a wheel. It's yeah. just, it's, it's, well, it's like, like it's like they found every loophole mm -hmm. and all they're doing is with these uh, laws is they've created more loopholes. And our um um our ex sheriff Villanueva, he um, he coined this phrase and he called it the homeless industrial complex. Mm. And he said that you'll it'll never get sold because oh look, there's our first cop we've seen. The first cop. First cop. This is like a real. Place. We've been driving now for over an hour. Yeah. That's the first cop we've seen. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So not this target, but a target uh, right over here. Um, woman that, that works for me, she went there, it was nine o'clock at night, and she nearly, she nearly got trafficked. This team of three, a girl and two guys, they all came up to her individually, were complimenting her, being like, oh, you're so beautiful, like, where's your clothes from? Do you live around here? And, you know, what are you doing after this? And, and they were like, but she would kind of, was letting it know, like, I don't want anything to do with you, like, leave me alone. And they followed her out of Target. She went to the security guy and was like, can you help me? These people are like, they won't leave me alone. She drove around for an hour and a half and two cars were chasing her. Oh my God. Yeah, like a full on, they were gonna like throw her in a bag and you know, yeah. sell her on the internet. Yeah, I imagine trafficking is a big issue here. And that's- Overall. I mean, it's, it's like the dirty little secret, I think, of most major cities at this point. Yeah. It is, it is just rampant. Like, look at all that. Right there. I want to ask this dude a question, man. Oh, he said, what's that dude recording me for? They look young, too. Yeah. Those, they, those guys did look young. Those were not like old, you know, old fucking hobos. 
Lights, ah. and, got lights and sirens. He's rolling out. Yeah. Why is he going to come off? It's coming up on your, yeah, your left. And they'll only, I think it's usually like, it only seems like they rush anywhere when there's like weapons involved. And you hear someone with a gun or a knife or something and they kind of boogie, but. So it's almost like they've given up on a petty crime. Yeah, petty crime it's is, not, it's just not worth it. Because yeah. now with all the cashless bail, everyone just gets let out. Huh. Hollywood sign. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever seen that. That's legitimately the Hollywood That's sign? That's the Hollywood sign, yeah. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> yeah. Much... I, I know, right? That's the, I was literally thinking, I was like, Looks bigger in the movies. Yeah, the whole thing is like underworld because I'm like, this is it. This is the whole place that yeah. everybody was like, Hollywood. It's like what? It's Tower of Babylon. Yeah, the movies, the all the sitcoms and all the. It's like this is it. It's like damn. This I bet you it used to be badass. Oh, dude, it was great. There was like bands every night and just always something going on. So now I've got I still my show I do for Travel Channel is uh, Night of Terror, so it's a paranormal ghost hunt show, and I bring people along, like bring celebrity guests to come do ghost hunts. How long have you been doing that? That one's been going, it started in, during COVID as like one-off specials, and then we did a series this last year. Um, so, you know, a few years now, and then before that I had a show. I, I kind of get bounced around a lot on Travel Channel with different paranormal shows. Yeah. Um, then now I have my podcast called Ghosts and Grit, and then I have the family podcast, and so I'm producing all of that. Where, where can people find Ghost and Grit? Where's that at? Uh, you just go to Jack Osborne on YouTube, and it takes you to Ghost and Grit, or just look up Ghost and Grit wherever you find podcasts. All right. Yeah. Appreciate you, Jack. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and thanks for coming out and seeing my, you know, what used to be great city. Hey, guys, I, I hope you enjoyed that. We, we got the opportunity to drive around a lot, uh, and there's even more content we focused on, especially about Jack's, perspective on his individual preparedness. You talk about a kid who grew up in Hollywood, became a, a kind of an A-list guy, and then have all these shows, and he doesn't have a security element. I mean, he went to a local coffee store and just wearing sunglasses and a ball cap, nobody even recognized him. Um, but he takes security very serious. We even go over his EDC, which is kind of cool, because he, he takes that um, very pointed and very deliberately every single day. He's trained with everybody. He's trained with me uh, at our local range in San Bernardino, Route 66 Sport Shooting Park. Um, and he's somebody who, who is looking to homestead in a separate location on land. We even get into that a little bit. Um, speaking of EDC, if you're listening to this and you're interested in all the things that we do, make sure you go to the long form conversation, which is in studio for Mike Force podcast. That's a separate YouTube channel and a separate audible podcast that you can find on Spotify, wherever podcasts are found. You can actually use uh, one of my favorite knives, which is the Speed Goat that I use for EDC that I carry in my Philcraft fanny pack. That Speed Goat um, is now readily available in stock, unlike the Philcraft Survival Collab knife, uh, where we have limited runs because he's making everything in America um, and high quality, high integrity as a company, uh, not outsourcing it to China ever. Uh, but some of the models, including the Speed Goat, which I carry in my fanny pack, are available at Montana Knife Company. Uh, the website's down below, and if you use MF10, you can save 10%. Guys, we got a lot of things to, to talk about in part two. I'm really excited about it. Make sure you go to Patreon to follow the underground and all the bonus content at patreon.com forward slash Mike Lever. Thanks, guys.